All right, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so my background, my PhD background was in more of a mathematical ecology. I modeled bee pollination in almond orchards. I used the a PDE model with cross and self diffusion to model the interactions of uh, honeybees amongst themselves as well as honeybees with uh, other pollinators to to see the dispersion of bees moving between different uh, varieties of almond. So my my ecology background uh, kind of still persists, but I was also interested in starting some sort of epidemi epidemiology. And so I my collaborators. Anuj Mubai and uh, Christopher Cribb Zaleta um, had this project in mind that uh, when I asked them, or when I saw one of their presentations, they invited me to work with them. And what this is, is we're looking at the Sylvatic host of, uh, or the wild animal host, which um, for the, the host that carry the parasite which causes Chagas disease in humans. So this will allow me to kind of start a a little transition between my uh, epidemio between my ecology background to epidemiology. The T. cruzi is a parasite shown at the bottom of the screen, and T. cruzi comes in six different strains. Only two strains are in the U.S. Strain one and strain four. T. cruzi is spread by a vector, the triatomine vector, and this vector will bite uh, will bite its host, uh, usually when the hosts are sleeping. So. For humans, when we're sleeping, we're bundled up, and all that's exposed is our face. So when the vector will bite, the vector bites our face, sometimes even on the lips, and so this vector has gotten the nickname, the kissing bug. Uh, T. cruzi is found in over 100 mammalian species, and when T. cruzi is in humans, it's known as Chagas disease, well, in type one. So this boy on the right of the screen has been bit by a vector on his eye on the left side, so his eye is swollen. That's one of the signs of being infected or being bitten by the vector. Chagas disease, um, many of you might not be aware, but Chagas disease, uh, the first stage doesn't really have, uh, well, it has mild symptoms. So there's swelling, fever, it's just typical stuff that you might see, nausea, vomiting, and then there's some swollen, get, swollen glands or an enlarged liver or spleen. Some people won't even show symptoms of the acute phase. Now other people, acute phase is all that they have. Or if you get the acute phase, you might go 10 to 20 years after being bit before you show symptoms of a more chronic uh, phase. And these chronic phases can be pretty severe from irregular heartbeat, an, infl an inflamed heart, uh, congestive heart failure. So the, these are more serious problems uh, that occur, but it occurs 10 to 20 years after you, you've been uh, infected. So all this while, you're carrying the parasite uh, without even knowing it. Chagas disease is a problem in Latin America. About 16 to 18 million people have been diagnosed. In the US, it's not a problem yet. Although uh, it has been estimated that up to half a million people in the U.S. do have that, and many of these people are migrating from Latin America, or they're living in Texas, close to Mexico, where in northern Mexico there, is a, there still is a problem. Um, Chagas disease, although not as well known as other things, may have um, a huge economic burden. It's been recently estimated that globally, Chagas disease has uh, about a seven billion dollar burden to the economy. And that's mainly from uh, death, uh, loss of, loss of uh, work due to uh, premature death, uh, as well as uh, health cost issues. And put this in perspective, uh, the rotavirus and the cholera, vi uh, and cholera are roughly about the same that just Chagas disease is, whereas most of the public have heard of these disease. Not many people have heard of Chagas disease. And even uh, places like the WHO uh, ha have um, things set in place to, uh, to fight these. Now, also uterine cancer is 6.7 billion, cervical cancer, oral cancer, things that people are familiar with is not as much. Although 
If you look at uh, other cancers like lung disease, it's about an $80 billion dollar, uh, burden to the economy. Um, so it's not as bad as some diseases, but ones that people do know, it, it does have a larger economic cost. In the US, it's $0.9 billion dollar burden. Compare that to Lyme disease, where there's a lot of money going into uh, looking at Lyme disease, uh, the economic burden is $2.5 billion. So even though it's less, it's still something that we should be aware about. T. cruzi is transmitted to vectors when the vector has a blood meal, when the vector bites an infected host. Hosts can get the parasite th uh, three different methods. Vertically, so from the mother to uh, her baby. Orally, so when you consume it for a meal. And then the other way, and the way I'm going to be focusing on today, is when the vector bites its host, after the bite, the bite is not what infects the host. After the bite, they'll defecate right next to the bite mark. And then the host will scratch at uh, the bite mark because it's itchy. And in doing so, by the scratching, uh, moves the feces, which has the parasite, into the wound, and then infecting it. So we sort of see this little cycle on the, on the right um, in, in uh, stage one. Okay, in, in stage one, we have that the, vec the vector will bite the host, and then after the host uh, scratches, it goes inside the host and spreads. And then all the way in stage five on the bottom here, we have that uh, another vector will bite an infected human and then get the disease. So that's the cycle of, of the transmission. Vectors, there are, there are over 130 vector species in the US. We're just going to look at two. T. sanguisuga and T. gerstecheri. These two figures are not, are not these exact vectors, but they are uh, triatomi vectors. So just to give you an idea of what they look like. Now, host, host can range from anything from uh, domestic chickens, dogs, to uh, skunks, possums, uh, armadillos. But we're going to look at the Sovatic the wild host, in this case, just in South Texas, and focus on raccoons and wood rats. We're focusing on South Texas because if you look in region one and two, region one and two down here have the host wood rats, but they also have the vector T. gerstecheri. So, so we have T. gerstecheri and wood rats ranging in one and two. In two and three, we have raccoons uh, ranging in that region, as well as T. sanguisuga. So we have an overlap over here in region two. In region two, also T. sanguisuga will feed on both vector or both host species. So what we can have happen in northern Mexico, where there is a problem with Chagas disease, the parasite uh, via uh, a wood rat and T. gerstecheri, uh, an infected one, can then move from North Mexico to South Texas. With an infected wood rat, we have a, uh, we have a T. sanguisuga feed on the wood rat, get infected, and then feed on a raccoon. We have a host switch infecting the raccoon. And the raccoon will then bring the disease all throughout the US Southeast. So that's a problem. Uh, that's a, a very high potential of having an outbreak all the way out here. So that, that's what we're looking at, is that these multiple interacting vector host cycles, uh, as well as the migration, so how can, how can it spread? But we're going to focus just on region two, that overlapping area. And these Sovetic hosts are reservoirs. So the hosts are not affected by T. cruzi, but they just allow the the disease to, or the parasite to persist, um, and then there's potential for spillover to humans. So the goal that we want to do is model the interactions of the vectors and the host in South Texas, and be able to quantify the contact rates. With contact rates, we can then estimate budding rates, as well as a transmission. 
So the main goal is to quantify contact rates of the vectors and hosts. So we're we're going to use an agent-based model. So those of you unfamiliar with an agent-based model, uh, these are just a few uh, things of what agent-based are. Agent-based are also known as an individual-based model. So individuals or agents uh, are the main things through these models rather than looking at a population in whole. Um, they, ha they interact with the environment and different patches. And what I'm using is NetLogo. So to set up, what we have is we have three different habitats. We have a prickly pear area. And this is what a, uh, this picture on the right is a prickly pear. So that's more of a desert type of area. We have prickly pears. And wood rats live in prickly pear areas. Wood rats have nests. The other area we have is wooded areas. And that's where raccoons are. And raccoons, will say, live in dens. And then the third area is neither of the two. The T. sanguisuga, as I mentioned, will feed on both raccoons and wood rats, but if given the choice, they prefer raccoons. Whereas T. gristecheri will only feed on wood rats. So this is what the sample that I'll set up. We have the green patches represent woods. The yellow patches represent the prickly pear, and the black represents neither. The boxes over here represent um, a nest, a wood rat's nest, and the triangles represent a den. And then uh, we have raccoons are the circles, and wood rats are the X. The insect-looking uh, things uh, are vectors. So the white vector is T. sanguisuga, and the pink vector is T. gristecheri. Now, what we have here is we set uh, beforehand a certain percentage of the, uh, of the grid to be uh, wooded area. So say, for instance, say 30% wooded area and maybe 30% uh, prickly pear area, and then the last 40 would be neither or whatever. E but each time. We will say we'll have a fixed percentage, and we randomly just generate a bunch of patches over. So right here, every time we set up, it might be different. Whereas um, in the future, actually, I do want to look at clustering effect. But right now, this is just random. So um, for instance, this is what it, it looks like. If I set 80% of the, the population, or 80% of the patches to be wooded area, you see a lot more woods. But each time I set up, the environment looks different. And that's just because every time it's all random, but with the same percent. And all right. And each patch is the size of 10.4 meters by 10.4 meters. And that represents the average distance between two dens. And we're going to have uh, 150 acres representing the whole scale. So the methods I use, each time step in the agent-based model represents one day. We only care about when the vectors are feeding on the host. We don't care what happens in between, just when they're feeding. And so that's when the hosts are resting. So during the daytime, the host will do whatever they, they want, usually foraging for food. And then at the end of the day, we'll, we'll take a time, uh, uh, sh time step. The agents in this are each patch, or each uh, den or nest. And in those dens or nests, we have hosts, raccoons and wood rats. And each host is, a, is an agent. Vectors have different properties. Juvenile vectors, unlike adult vectors, don't move. So in order to save on computation, we are going to just let juvenile vectors be uh, a property of the den or nest that they're in and let adult vectors be an, an agent. And for hosts, it doesn't matter if there's juveniles or adults, because all they are to the vectors are just a big hunk of blood meal. So, so they're fine if they move or not. Whereas the, the, the vectors, they can be in a den. And if the raccoon leaves, the juvenile vectors are stuck there and will either starve 
or mature and then be able to move on their own. Um, the dynamics of this broken down to two different parts, demography and dispersal. And we have a demography and dispersal each for a vector and for a host. For the vector demography, we have reproduction, so birth, we have death, and then we have development, so from juvenile to adult. And the death, it goes for both the death of juvenile and death of adults, and then the development. So what it looks like is we'll have an adult vector will give birth to a juvenile. Each time step, the juvenile will either die or survive. Those that survive uh, may develop or they'll stay as a juvenile. And then when they develop into an adult, the adult dies or survives and the cycle repeats. For host, it's, it's a little bit simpler. We just have birth and death for that. Uh, I did a deterministic model, and this was just to give me an idea of how, of how uh, the demography looks like. After I made this flowchart, I sort of I wrote out uh, an ODE like this to give me an idea what what my results are going to be. And this actually proved quite helpful at one point when uh, I had an error in the code and had a population blowing up. But obviously, um, based on this ODE, it didn't. So this was just an ODE to help me. What we have is we have uh, the the change in population of a juvenile birth uh, minus the death minus the survival or the uh, development and then the adult uh, vector population is just uh, those that develop minus those that die. Uh, yeah, right. And then, yeah, so this is just one. And, um, but then I can make this more complicated. So. I could make every single one, every single den or nest one, or um, yeah, every single den or nest one, and then all wooded areas that don't have a den will be another uh, will be an, another um, category, and then it, yeah. So, but it this was just to kind of give me an idea at first. Um, if I were to then start modeling exactly like how we have over here in the agent-based model, then it gets kind of ugly. And, and this is just, just to help me out to get a better understanding of what was happening. For the dispersal, for a vector, well, if they find, if they find a host, then they're just going to stay there and eat. There's no reason for them to move if there's a meal right there. So they're not going to expend energy moving if a host is present. If a host leaves, then these vectors will, will wait for a few days. But there comes a, a certain point where they just get too hungry that they can't wait anymore. And they'll actively look for a food. So we have this threshold uh, where they wait and then leave. When they do decide to disperse, it's a random dispersal. We'll pick, uh, we'll see these vectors will go um, a random direction and a random distance. Now. We have a, uh, a radius around the host, around the vector, and if there's a host within that radius, they will move to the nearest host because vectors, as they're going, will pick up on clues from the host, uh, such as um, CO2 emissions or heat emissions. Uh, something will, will tell these vectors that there's a host nearby, and they'll move. If there is no host nearby, then they'll the, they'll wait, and the next time step will move again, and they'll keep doing that until either they find a host or they die of starvation. Hosts will disperse by uh, an agitation. If you have enough biting, the host won't want to stay in that den or nest. So if, if there's a certain threshold that passes the number of bites that a host can handle, and juvenile vectors' bites uh, aren't, as, um, aren't as painful as adult vector bites, so so uh, they're weighted differently. But if there's a certain threshold that passes, then the host will disperse. Hosts also disperse looking for food. And, and when they look for food, they sometimes don't return to the same den or nest two nights in a row. But at the end of each night, they are always at, each, at a den or nest. You don't see uh, a raccoon taking, uh, going to sleep on the lawn. You know, they're 
always in a den where they're safe. So I, I ran the simulation. Actually, let me show you what the simulation looks like. Um, so, yeah, so. So I'm running the simulation, and if I slowed it down, we can see um, we can see these hosts and vectors uh, moving throughout. What I'm measuring here uh, over here is the contacts that that uh, a host has with each vector, and then on the second the second plot is the contacts that each vector has with a host, and we're measuring each one because we're really curious about the host switching of these vectors and how, how it transmits or how we, we can have a, um, the T cruise that can go from North Mexico all the way to the US Southeast. So we're looking at going from an infected wood rat to an infected <coughs> raccoon. Down here, we just have a population uh, <coughs> models for each of them. And uh, as time goes on, we get stability throughout. So let me show you what some of the results are. So um, I ran this model, uh, I think, 18 times. And then I took the average of the 18. These are all, this is a stochastic process. So we're going to have uh, some oscillation. But it does oscillate. Uh, and it turns out that raccoons and wood rats oscillate around 65 individuals each. And um, the, the, the dynamics of uh, raccoons and wood rats are independent of the number of, um, or the demography rather, is independent of the number of, uh, of uh, vectors. Whereas vectors depend on, on a host before they starve. So what we have here is the vector population. Uh, the red line is T. sanguisuga, the blue is T. gristecheri. And, and they do oscillate, but they do um, oscillate around a number. Now, here's what we're trying to look for is the contact rates. And so we're, we're looking at the host contacts with the vectors. The green, this green line way up here, is the number of contacts that wood rats have with T. gristecheri. The blue line is the number of contacts wood rats have with T. sanguisuga. And on the bottom, the blue line is the number of contacts that wood rats have with T. sanguisuga. So yes. Oh, yes, excuse me. So uh, uh, the x-axis is time. So I, I run that for uh, 20,000. The y-axis is the number of contacts. So at each time step, I, I measure how many contacts there are. So how many, how many um, times is a vector with a host? And yeah, e e each, each one is per day. So um, and, and th yeah, that's yeah, about 20,000 days. It's just the number of contacts. So I, I, I'll look at that at each time step. I'll say, how many, how many uh, wood rats uh, are at the same place with a T. sanguisuga? And, and the total population? N uh, no, the, the, the total population. So this is the, the total population. It, it does oscillate. But, but this, this oscillation is, is, j is between 60 and 70, so it's, it, but it's, it's a very small. This is the vector population. So the vector population does have a little bit more oscillation than uh, the host. But, and, and so I mean, this ranges from 5 to 800 for T. sanguisuga. Is there survival dependent on available host? Yes, the, the, their survival depends on available host, because um, right here, I. I put a carrying capacity for each uh, for each nest or den, so there's a, a fixed amount that there can be. So if if there are fewer hosts, then there are fewer places for them to, to eat at. Now, T. sanguisuga has a greater population than T. gristecheri, and that is because well, T. sanguisuga has twice as many opportunities to eat. They have two different hosts that they can eat upon. Whereas a, a T. gristecheri, so um, let me go back to this screen. Uh, what we might have is um, 
if you are, for instance, right here, an x is a, yeah, an x is a, wrong. Well, it, wherever uh, t sangosuga is, there's always going to be a good uh, a host that's within a reasonable, well, not always, but more likely. Whereas if you were uh, Gersteckeri, you only have one, so you might not be near the wood rats that you need. Okay. And then over here, too, this is, I measured the number of contacts that each vector has with a host, the, the exact opposite. And the axes are the same. The x-axis is the time, and the vertical axis is the number of contacts measured at each time step. And the blue is the number of contacts that T. Gersteckeri has with wood rats. Green is the number of contacts T. Gersteck T. Sanguisuga has with raccoons. And blue is the number of contacts that T. Sanguisuga has with wood rats. T. Sanguisuga will eat both wood rats or raccoons, but if given the choice, they will prefer wood rats. So that's why the wood rats is much higher than the, the raccoons down here. Do okay. Um. Yeah. No. The the no. The, the, this is supposed to be the T. Sangosuga with wood rats down here, and because the T. T. Sangosuga will prefer <coughs> raccoons when they can. If there's not one available, then they do have that fallout option of getting a wood rat. So. The next thing I looked at is what happens, well, if there's a change in the environment, a change in um, the percentage. So we, what if there's only 10% wooded area, but 80% prickly pear? Well, that means that um, sometimes you might not find a lot of wooded areas for uh, raccoons. So the chances of, uh, of um, a vector finding that host won't be strong. So I, I varied all these different parameters, and I ran and I ran the simulation. This time I ran the simulation only one time, uh, and and then I picked uh, random points, and I, I I ran it just one time because this is a stochastic process, and if I randomly uh, chose points, I think I uh, so over here the system does sort of stabilize. I picked after 2,000 and onward, and I picked I think. Every 100, uh, 100 time steps, I would pick a point, and I put it into a histogram over here. So this, the x-axis, represents the number of contacts. The y-axis represents, uh, yeah, the, the y-axis represents the different habitat types, and then the vertical axis represents the the number in that falls in this histogram, and this first axis down here, or the first row, corresponds to 10% wooded area, 80% prickly pear. And as we go back, the back one is 70% uh, wooded area, 20% prickly pear, and then a 10% of none. But what, what they all correspond to, this is just for the number of contacts that a wood rat has with T. sanguisuga. And right, I haven't, I haven't uh, found any patterns yet. Uh, or any trends, it, it, it's about this one, it's about, uh, about 100. This one, I think, is about 90 as we go back, and then it goes to like 120 and 90. So it, it oscillates around 100 e uh, regardless of the percentage that I use for the different habitats. And so if this is the wood rats with T. sanguisuga, let me back up here. Wood rats with T. sanguisuga is this blue line. Or, yeah, is this blue line, and that is about a hundred. So, um, that does correspond to what we what we've uh, seen earlier. Um, well, future work. Right now, we're still trying to figure out exactly uh, how uh, what we're going to do with these biting rates or um, different scenarios. Once we get all the biting rates that we need, or the contact rates, we'll estimate biting rates, and that comes. Uh, Fairly simple. You get a bite. You get a contact. A certain percent of the time you have a contact, you'll end up 
with a byte. And then when you have a byte, then there's also the chance of the transmission of T cruzy. I'm, I'm looking at habitat clustering right now before I, I'm looking at different habitat clusterings before I go into the biting rates, um, looking at the effects of the contact rates. And then one thing we want to look at is, well, what about the human contacts? And so in the future, I would like to have an agent-based model that will also have humans in, in interacting and see when humans would come in contact. Right now, humans don't interact too much with this uh, Sovetic cycle, uh, except for the, uh, a hunter that might be out in the, in the wild uh, down in Texas or somewhere. But as humans do encroach upon these territories, humans will get more, uh, uh, more exposure and possibly a higher uh, risk of having contacts. And also with climate change, these vectors and hosts will have different cycles. And what will that bring about? So that's uh, what I'm looking at. Um, these are the references that I use. And I'd like to thank my postdoc mentor right now is Carlos Castillo Chavez. My two collaborators on this project are Anuj Mubai at Northeastern Illinois University and Christopher Cribb Zaleta at the University of Texas in Arlington. And I met my collaborators at the Mathematical and Theoretical Biology Institute, where we were all working. And uh, one of them was uh, presenting a talk that got me all started into this. And uh, right now, I'm currently funded by the National Alliance uh, Fellowship. All right, uh, that is a, 